have yeah. the table. Oh, I don't have the period of table here. I should have done it, actually. But if you look here, zirconium is quite a likely product from four and a half billion years of experimentation in the crust of the Earth. Okay? So lead is a very high output. This is why we saw it in many experiments. Uh, uh, Parkamov, I showed you in my slides, he synthesized it in his core. And interestingly, he synthesized lead, and he also synthesized tin. This is in Adamenko's, uh, Adamenko's, uh, um, Leclerc, and here you've got SN here. Quite likely product to be synthesized. So in every single case, if you look to nature, and you run with our, uh, uh, our Parkamov reaction tables, almost any Linux system we put to, we almost no effort at all, what, the, what it calculates is what has been seen in the experiment. And it's so predictable. And what that means is you can use the table to choose elements to get a particular outcome. And that becomes a whole more useful tool. That's the principle governing the elements that are most likely to form. Simple. It's going into a very small box. And here's the proof. You have the Amasa plate here. This plate in a vibration system here. This is out of that vibration system. It's vibrating phonons this way, phonons that way, and phonons that way. It's also got vibrations like this, and it's also got flex in the middle. Okay, It's very fault tolerant, but at some point you're going to get peak wave interference. So you have a massive deflection here. This causes this. This is a color microscopy image. And you can see here, it was reflective and it was refractive, meaning it was a crystal of something under the optical. So I wanted to see under the SEM. This is one of these spots that you see here. And around the outside is nearly pure palladium. This is palladium coated steel. Uh, this is palladium. So on the, on the pressure end wave, it's cleaned off the, the, the mess. This is all accretion, and it's quite a lot of accretion. Most of this around here is iron. In the center of the center, you've got another spot. The center of the center of the center is diamond. Diamond tells you that it's pushing things into the smallest box it can, because it's the same structure as the physical vacuum. You can't really get any better, anything much better, okay? But the diamond is only popping out of something that's vastly more dense than diamond. So you're saying the, the uh, it's trying to go into a small box. It's down density. So, if you are, and the most energetic outcome is the one that has the nucleons that occupy the smallest space time. You understand? Because energy comes from distortion in the physical vacuum, right? Whether it's chemical or nuclear. So, so by uh, getting to two nucleons that occupy less space time. But more importantly, if you can take a fermionic isotope and split it to make two bosons, or somehow uh, end up with bosons or chuck out a proton. So, let me run you through the basic understanding that I have after seven and a half years. Lead pushed hard will produce lead. You see it everywhere. If you have light elements, the lead will fission into the middle. It predominantly fissions to tin. Tin will then put fission to zirconium. Right? And so these are seen in everything. If you have a very aggressive system, you'll push beyond uranium. This is not a very aggressive system. It takes radioactive elements, it takes impurities like mercury and lead and so on you don't want in your fish water or in your drinking water, and it makes them into bioavailable atoms. It takes lighter elements like hydrogen and oxygen and it makes them into bioavailable atoms. It doesn't do the nasty stuff that caused Leclerc and his partner two years of uh, radiation recovery. Uh, and it has caused some deaths in, in this field. So, there was the guy in yeah. Hampshire. So let me carry on. Exactly the same, extremely simple logic based on what nature shows you for four and a half billion years of experimentation. Elements are statistically more likely to be synthesized light when starting with light size stuff. So that's what happens, of course. If you're trying to build something, it's going to be easier to put one Lego brick out the door than it is going to put two Lego bricks out the door, isn't it? It's less effort. Second, uh, that's one, one hydrogen observed coming from Lena reaction at high energy by P and Telly, 6.7 MeV, and he uses the, the nickel as a catalyst to, to turn it into a, a particle accelerator, and then he does preferentially a neutronic fusion with uh, boron isotopes and lithium isotopes in his valid patent, valid to 2032. Okay, so he got round shoulders uh, comment in 2006 by saying you're never going to make excess heat from this because it's always going to destroy your reactor, which it will do, but not if you do what PNTL is doing and just use that kinetic function. Okay, so, but the, what's interesting about 1H is first it's the lightest element. So if you're going to make any element nucleus, Adamenko says you get an electron mac nucleus macrocluster. Okay, now the electron nuclear macrocluster is in an extremely dense thing, much, much denser than diamond and it has lost all identity. It loses identity by um, 
uh, by becoming bosonic. It's just that it's, just, it's occupying as little space time as possible. It's a, like it's a Bose Einstein condensate type of thing, right? But it, he says periodically a new stable nuclei will form. Now, if it's a fermion, like proton, it'll get spat out. That gives you your protons that P and is observing. But what do you also observe in Leno? The next one that you observe up the table, which is unusual for Leno, is actually a radioactive isotope. What is that? It's tritium. What is interesting about tritium? Tritium is a fermion. Okay? So things that can't live in a very small space get shut, chucked out the door. Also, as you start synthesizing heavier elements, you need more neutrons and if, if, to keep them stable. So if you haven't got neutrinos being acting and making neutrons from electrons in play, it will be spitting out protons as it goes up the table. So there's a good reason to see protons coming out of the system. Then rock form and forming elements predominate in fusion and fission and reaction. So, in the fusion systems down here, we see rock forming elements. In the fission systems with this tungsten and, and with the indium over there, relatively heavy elements, we see the exact same elements you see in this group here, preferentially synthesized. The same things that ball lightning preferentially synthesizes. Um, so, ne next one down is elements that are formed of alpha particles are common bulk reaction products. Why? Because alpha is a very efficient packing density in the, in the structure of the physical vacuum. This is why uh, uh, one proton, a deuteron, a triton all occupy the same space time as an uh, as, uh, alpha particle. They all occupy the same space time. That's why you get the best energy from fusing two deutrons together per nuclear. And so, what do we see in this? Uh, the, you see these particular shapes all over Lena experiments that I've observed. And this is one side of a, 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 a soliton, which is what I call a black evo, which is, a, I call it a black, it's a, not a black hole, it's a black donut. And the material is trapped in the plasma pinch. And this is what you were seeing Lutz Chainman talk about. It's trapped in there and it's being crushed. And, uh, pressures that are un absolutely unimaginable. And so what happens is, is when it comes out, the, what you're seeing is this is copper oxide, but what's crashed and coming back into our free space is carbon, oxygen, and calcium. These uh, double magic stable atoms. 208 PB is the heaviest element that's stable. That's what all these Leonard, Leonard systems produce, because if it goes beyond it, it immediately fissions back until you've run out of light elements. So that's why you see both lots and lots. So, uh, hydrogen isotope in a special state appears to be important. That's motor cannon, mono, uh, Mars. Reactions are many body and canvas sequential. So in our reaction table system at, uh, at nanosoft.co.nz, you can say, I just want 1H and 1H, and you run the reaction table and it'll go all the way through to helium by doing iterative processes. That's about as simple as you do. Um, uh, like for instance, in this one, he put magnesium chloride, so cesium chloride, into this vibration system uh, to see if the cesium one would be changed, right? Now, what he saw was I had what, we, what George saw at the uh, Hungarian University when they did isotopic analysis, uh, sorry, elemental analysis on this. He just sent me the data. But I plugged it into the Parkinov reaction calculator because the, the heaviest, the, the most element produced was iodine. And I thought, well, that's weird. Everyone's expecting barium from cesium. Iodine. Well, you know what the other reaction product is when you take cesium and, and uh, uh, cesium and chlorine, which it is, it's cesium chloride. You take those two atoms, the most energetic outcome you can possibly have is iodine and potassium. And these are what you see. And then if you take the potassium and you combine it with cesium, you see the second most common isotope, which is strontium. Absolutely everything is predicted by on the very simple basis that it's trying to pack it into a small box and it's following the rules. Incredibly simple, just on a phenomenological basis, and there isn't a single experiment that I've tested that doesn't, and it's so boring for me now. It's literally boring. Someone sends some data, and if it's genuine Lena, it, it, you, you go, okay, well, it's, it's, I'm just recognizing them now, but. But you can do it, but the great thing is you can use this uh, system at uh, nanosoft.co.nz. You can use it to choose elements to target particular elements. And that gets really exciting when you think about it. So can I show you over here? Um, sorry. Please do so. So what's happened here? They take the Armas of vibrator tank like this, and it's going through an electrolysis. Yes, it's going through electrolysis. So, Harkimov is assuming that because he knows 
that Lena seems to accelerate beta isotope decays. The only real way that that can occur easily is by changing the order of the reaction and inputting neutrons, ra neutrinos, rather than having antineutrinos coming out. And he's saying that you know, under his experience since uh, 1988, um, uh, that if you have temperatures of a thousand degrees and above, like I was talking about in his reactor, you don't see an XTT until you get above that. You start synthesizing enough and, uh, neutrinos and antineutrinos by electron, uh, electron collisions, okay? So they're ultra low energy neutrinos. These have a large wave function and they can interact with lots and lots of atoms. So what I thought was, with the Amasa system, it's supposedly got a gas that's at 3,900 3, degrees Kelvin. That's all the way up here. It's producing a, a lot of neutrinos and antineutrinos. So if I got some indium foil, uh, where is it, indium foil, indium foil is 87% a beta isotope. If we're synthesizing a lot of neutrinos, maybe it's going to do a lot of nuclear interactions with indium foil. Plus, indium foil melts at a ridiculously low temperature, 152 volt, whatever. And it's highly malleable. So, but the crazy thing about this indium foil, which by the way, was only 0.75 of a micron, the same thickness as a human hair, is it survived for much longer than a one millimeter thick titanium sheet. And that's the bizarre thing about a Mars gas or HHO gas, it interacts differently with different materials. So it's stuck around on here. Well, I measured it with the bolometer to 130.2 degrees. Everyone joked, but then uh, 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 Slobodan Stankovic used electron temperatures using def laser diffraction techniques and measured the average temperature as 130 degrees. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> who would have thought? Um, but when they measured it at the university, they put tro potassium chromate ions so they could see the flame. However, if you take potassium chromate and you do the fusion reaction in the Parkamov reaction tables, you know what you get? Four helium and nickel 62. There isn't a better outcome. And so the temperature is not coming from the gas, it's coming from all the freaking fusion energy. <laughs> or actually, strictly speaking, in nucleon exchange energy. Okay? Amazing. So, the, so when the splat of this material came down on the ground, you had a debris field of perfect crystals of indium oxide. Now the surface of this is indium oxide and nitride. Okay? What's happened is, in my view, is under the surface, some nucleon exchange reactions have occurred. Okay? And they produced a fantastic amount of heat. That's caused flash plasmaification, let's call it that, of the indium underneath the oxidized nitride nitride layer. It's caused a volcano. And you can even see the debris fields of these, these uh, plasma uh, uh, indium that's then come down as perfect crystals and rained down on. And then you have these ejecta of synthesized element, like this, this tongue of silicon dioxide, or uh, uh, iron spheres. There's an iron sphere here, there's not uh, iron, or, or, but typically, they're all of the reaction products you would expect uh, from this system, and I've got it on here somewhere. From titanium, it's really, really easy to understand. Sorry, tungsten. So the tungsten, this is a feature on the tungsten. This, this is the tungsten before, perfectly smooth. This is magnified more, pretty much smooth. Just got tungsten and uh, uh, thorium in it. Now, we apply the, this is, this is the tungsten, applied for a few seconds, then what do we see? Under, under the surface, we see these cracks like the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and through the cracks, there's spheres that have appeared, okay? What are the spheres? Well, in it, they, they are sodium, magnesium, aluminium, silicon, sulfur, potassium, calcium, titanium, iron. They're all the things you see over there in the rock-forming elements. So, you've got that. So, now you look here, you're running into the Parkamov reaction tables, and you say, what is the most likely fission product from tungsten isotopes? You know what? It's calcium and xenon. Oh my god. Now, let's walk over here. This is atomic volume, right? Now remember what I said, it's trying to pack it into a really small box, okay? It's atomic volume. Where's our tungsten? Let's find our tungsten. Where is he? Where is he? Can you see him? Oh, where is he? There, 10 tungsten. So that is... Uh, Osmium's the most dense, by the way. Tungsten is 10, okay? So one atom of tungsten is uh, 10 units on, on the atomic volume scale. Now, look at xenon. 
it's all the way up here. But the tungsten, we don't know the xenons existed because we didn't know that at the time because we only had an hour and a half to do our experimentation. But we can see in the aftermath that spheres rich in calcium in every case has been formed. Calcium, where is that? Calcium here is 20. Five to, yeah, to over to 26 units. So it occupies more than two and a half times the volume. So when, now the interesting thing is, uh, the, the, the net result is to produce energy, which means in that cluster, it's a favorable thing for it to do. But when the structure breaks down, the material comes back into our three space and it blows the top off the top of the tungsten. So you get those spheres coming out. Exactly the same thing as you're seeing in the Indian. The tungsten experiment lasted eight seconds. The, the, it's about five or six seconds for the Indian experiment with macro, massive, large-scale transmutation that matches nature and matches the most energetic likely outcome that you should get. Experimenting, experimentation matching nature. And it takes eight to ten seconds to do. <laughs> Make it to four and a half billion years. <laughs> but the, 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 the knock-on effect from this is, Lena is happening all over the Earth all yeah. of the time. So I, if you look yeah. at my last slide, where is it on the, on the Amasa stuff? It's over there. I mean, I, I went to Japan because Brown's Gas, which Amasa is meant to be the gold standard of, in 1991, Brown demonstrated to US politicians that he could take cobalt, uh, sorry, that he could take americium 241 and in a few seconds reduce the radioactivity by 96%. Why? Because it, in my view, if you believe Parkamov, it's producing fantastic numbers of neutrinos. The americium doesn't want to be unstable. How do we know that? Because nature doesn't want to be unstable. These are all the primordial isotopes. Why does Lena work? Well, everyone wants to use uranium-235 because it gives you an incredible punch okay, of energy. Uh, and it's got a short half-life, so you can, you can make it do work easy. Now, what does everyone put in their experiments? Potassium. Potassium is the next primordial isotope that's likely to decay. It's also a beta emitter in, in at least one respect. So if you have a beta emitter of potassium, which is in carbon, then you are going to have in a system that has carbon. And what did, the, what did, the, what did the alchemists use? Potassium carbonate. Yeah, carbon is four alphas. Oh, I haven't got it there. Car carbon is, sorry, it's three alphas, it's tri-alpha. Carbon nucleus, 12 carbon, is a boson. You can fill up this thing. What do you end up at the end of the day? Carbon. This system likes using carbon. What do you mean when you say carbon is a boson? The nucleus of carbon is a boson. So here on a reaction calculator, you can specify whether you want fermions and bosons to go into the calculation and fermions or bosons to come out, okay? If you're trying to put things into a very small box, but a boson can form a Bose-Einstein condensate. So if you take one carbon atom, it occupies one unit of space-time in our very small box, right? But so does a billion carbon atoms. But if you try and put one hydrogen atom in there, a, a, a proton, it's going to say, I can't live with all you guys, I'm going to take a bit more space over here. So it gets kicked out. It's the same thing. Listen, I thought, we, we... I thought bosons and things like photons. They can be. Yes, photons, uh, 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 sound is a boson. But things that don't have mass. Uh, no, it's the integer charge when it comes to uh, isotopes. So isotopes, so we've got all the states for atomic boson or, or nuclear boson. So you, you can have a nuclear boson, so a nuclear, it's a fermion, but because it's because it's a tritium and you add an electron, it becomes a, a, a fermion. Or whatever it is, yeah, it's got, it's got uh, four half charged particles, making it up. Anyway, so the point is, is that that's what you see. And I, I tested in Sochi the uh, um, Hutchison coral, and it had synthesized nickel and synthesized lead. And guess what? The synthesized nickel had 3.7 times the natural ratio of the only bosonic isotope in the nickel. It also had 70% extra of the only bosonic isotope of lead. So what it's doing is it, when it's getting up to this heavy area and it's making lead, because it's having to pack all the nucleons it can into a small space, because it's trying to pack it into a small box, some nuclei 
are 207, it says, you don't fit around here, mate, get out. And so you get an increased concentration of the, non, the fermionic isotope of lead and fermionic isotope, and this is what you see at the other end of the table with hydrogen and uh, tritium. And the tritium is the outlier because it gets kicked out of the Lena system, but it's actually radioactive. It's, it's the one outlier in Lena. What is this? T is tritium. Oh, you see here in the tables here, tritium. It's got a star to notify that it's radioactive. So when you understand that it's really just fitting things into a small box, uh, you just need to look at what nature's already done for four and a half billion years, and probably a lot longer on every other planet in the solar system, and other solar systems. Um, and it follows all the same logic, and, and all of the data you observe from experiments that lasting as long as eight seconds uh, support, the, support the nature. Any chance this is going to lead to a publication soon? I, I, I don't think nature could handle it. I, I Listen, the, all the people at Madison, Wisconsin University, I only showed them this, and that melted their brain. <laughs> and I didn't even show them the interesting, I did show them the interesting This is not public, by the way, yet. But here, there's a mixture of, uh, of fluorine from the PTFE and, and titanium, and it's in a, a band that's the same width as the, the thickness of this, and it's shifted into, it's like teleported into the middle of the material. And in the center, you see this dark bit here? That is a plasmoid, and it's come in and it's turned in this angle, in the same angle that this cluster forms, of these perfect titanium crystals. And on those titanium crystals, you see these filaments that go up like uh, as long as 10 or 20 microns. And the filaments are amazing because this is absolutely pure titanium. But if you go along the filaments, you have uh, uh, first, and this is going to the Parkamov reaction tables, but this is the observation first. If you take uh, titanium and you add uh, an alpha particle to it, you get chrome. That's what you see at the base. Then if you add an alpha particle to chrome, you get iron. That's what you see a little bit further up. And then if you add an alpha particle to iron, you get nickel. That's what you see a bit further up. And what do you see on the end? Carbon. So carbon somehow, in a plasmoid in my view, because I'm saying it forms diamonds, so it, the, the, the plasmoid, just like you see in sapphire, arranges itself in an electromagnetically equilibrium status around this crystal. So it's forming here and here and here. It's like forming tufts, but it's containing carbon within it. Just like I saw in the, in, in the lion reactor when I was firing the electron beam, there was just copper oxide, but every now and again you'd see this immense burst of carbon. And Matsumoto said after 13 years of research, these EVOs, more often not when they fail they just dump a load of carbon they dump other stuff but mostly they dump carbon so what's happening here is you've got these evos and they've organized themselves electromagnetically favorably around here and then they've grown out and starting from tungsten they've dumped three alpha particles out of the to carbon to yield the three titanium to chrome to, to chrome to iron and iron to nickel and then they've run out of titanium that's captured inside and they just carry on depositing a filament of carbon. You've got to go back and measure the Sorry? You've got to go back and measure the helium. No, the really interesting thing is this. The fact that tungsten, as we observe, every single sphere that's been synthesized uh, on the tungsten uh, has calcium in it in abundance, which means that if you look at the reaction tables I showed you earlier, fission of any isotope of tungsten yields calcium and xenon. Xenon is the preferred gas for ion drives, but NASA cannot use it for ion drives because the only source of xenon practically comes from nuclear reactors and it's radioactive and it swamps, you know, and it's, it's not good to use and it's extremely expensive. So with this, you'll be able to synthesize a lot of xenon. That's a billion dollar business right there. There's an unimaginable amount of wealth on what I've just told you. Uh, it's, it, 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 and, and from my point of view, and I have to thank this man because he stuck his neck on the line, he sold some property, and he bought the SEM that would enable us to actually spend a proper amount of time analyzing some of the samples we've collected from around the world over the last two years. And the, the, I, I mean, every time he woke up in the morning, I said, Alan, I'm not even sure I can handle this. It's, uh, uh, when people actually see this and they come to terms with it, you're seeing in seconds macro scale massive transmutation and I'm still alive right 
right in front of me. He was, he was so excited. Every third day, I had to tell him, turn the machine off and go to sleep. <laughs> Otherwise, it was 24 hours. Bob, have you, have you published this yet? No. 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 It, it, it's just... It, it this makes so, so much big. sense. It is so simple. Yes. And it matches nature. And, that is, that and you've got eight second experiments so you can test it with. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> I, I filmed it for myself to try like, to no, understand. No, I'd, it's I'd like a copy. Can uh, you give sure. me a copy? Yeah, 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 yeah sure. And I'll publish it. Uh, yeah. I don't care. Because it's, it's just, it's so intriguing. It's, it, it's I've been saying for a long time. The whole earth has been made out of it, uh, period. Uh, yeah. Every single thing that's been observed in Lena, I've explained in those the, the 16 points. There's a couple of points that I, that I run out of space on the table. Like you, you can rep replicate it every single day of the week on a massive scale. Yeah. <laughs> it's just yeah. a hilarious. It's and, and, and we're debating whether Lena exists. And Roy Shilamaza has been selling transmutation machines for the last 15 years all over Asia. He's got water products you spray on your face. He's got drinking water. He sells it to fish farms. People are consuming fish all over Japan and Asia that are being grown in his system. Because yeah. it's not like Leclerc and it's not like Adamenko. It's not going to the nth degree. It's not going bigger is better. It's working with nature. This yeah. is water running down a stream. It's subtle cavitation. And by subtle cavitation, it's creating from heavy toxins like mercury and lead and so on. It's creating by fissioning, obviously, we see it here from, from titanium and thorium, so tungsten and thorium and, and indium, heavy elements. It's fissioning them to, what do we read? Sodium, I'll have a bit of that in my blood. Magnesium, that's good for me. Aluminium, well, not so good for me, but anyway. Silicon, sulfur, potassium, calcium, I'll have all of them. Yeah. I'll have all of them. And so the reason is fish grow so fast and they're so healthy and the eels grow so fast and they're so healthy yeah. is because it's taking shit water and it's making bio-available elements yeah. that are easily absorbed and are recently synthesized. Yes. And it's taking water and making bioavailable elements that are easily synthesized. When you drink certain brands of water, you are drinking dead water. But when you drink water from a spring, there's things you cannot even possibly detect in there that are good for you. Yeah. Okay? This is making spring water every day of your life when you're on your starship and it's powered by your xenon drive. And, and all you've needed is the water, and the water can provide all the elements you need to, for your hydroponics units. It's, uh, yeah, it sounds so logical. <laughs> and it's all the same thing. Thanks, thanks a lot. It's all right, no worries. <laughs>